So Dave went and was going to come speak to us, and he was really excited, but he got sick today. And um, we got word of that just about 20 minutes ago. And um, Barkley said, well, I said, I kind of jokingly said, Barkley, you want to present to us? And he said, sure, I kind of felt like I should be here today. <laughs> he was supposed to be somewhere else, but he showed up, and, and um, he's got some things he's going to talk to us about. If you don't know Barkley, he, and they want to help me here a little bit, Barkley, yeah. but um, he's an alumni of our department. So he's one of our students, and after graduating, went and started Learning.com, and was really successful with that venture, and eventually sold that, and has since been doing some consulting work in healthcare and in education, uh, with different issues related to implementation and sustainability and, and things like that. And, and what did you say? And he is, yeah, and that's the other thing I was going to say, is he is a uh, half-time professor in our department, and teaches, I think right now this semester, you're teaching a class, is that correct? So, you know, if you see Burns on the class schedule, this is who it is, and he has some really interesting stuff that he can teach in some of the classes he has, too. So, anyway, we're excited to hear from you. Great. Well, I'm so grateful for all the time I had to prepare for, for this presentation. Um, as I thought um, about this opportunity, I've just been, you know, it's just been weighing on me for 20 minutes. But, um, <laughs> But seriously, I, I want to share something today that I think is so relevant to you as students in instructional psychology. People who have had my classes will be familiar with the language and the types of things I'll be talking about. Um, so I was an IPNT student here. Dave Williams was my chair back there. And I, I taught uh, at Orm High School. And, and create a little high school within a high school there called Community Bound and, and had that opportunity to teach in a public high school for six years. And following that, I, I went and was enrolled in a PhD program at the University of Cambridge in strategy and organizational economics. I really wanted to figure out how do you scale instruction? How do you scale learning to many, many people? And that, that was the, the challenge I, I had set for myself getting into this second PhD in, in England in, in strategy and organizations and economics. And so I was there for two years and got the really bright idea of trying to start a company in 1999-2000. Uh, and we, to, I, I recruited a friend and we started at CallLearning.com. So I finished all my coursework and. <coughs> Uh, exams at, at Cambridge, talked to the dean, and she said, hey, go go give this a shot. So we launched learning.com, and I was there for 10 years. And then I had the opportunity to sell my founder shares, and I then uh, was approached by BYU, and they said, hey, we'd love to have you come and help out. So I said, sure, and we, we were living in Portland, so I now live in Midway, Utah. And Cambridge was kind enough to readmit me to finish my dissertation. So I'm uh, right in the thick of that, um, gathering my data. I need to submit my three articles. How many here are PhD students? How many here are doing a three article dissertation model? Cool. It's, I, I really recommend it. It just seems like such a great way because then you're so prepared for the publication route. And so I have you know, just an extraordinary group of advisors from all over the, a lot of them are in the US, and they're very, very great, thoughtful people. And I have been studying healthcare, though my, my heart and soul are in, in education, and I'll, that I'll always be there. But I wanted to step out of education for a while. Sometimes you need to kind of step out of something you've been in for 20 years to see it from a new lens, to see it from different perspectives, and to, to understand how you can understand what it is you've been immersed in better. So I have been spending the last two years working and researching with Intermountain Healthcare. And they are trying to implement something that is absolutely parallel to what we're trying to do in education. They are doing um, in healthcare, and healthcare is a really interesting human endeavor. It's it's really challenging. Uh, the if you think public education is bureaucratic, 
and inefficient and um, political, health care is at least an order of magnitude greater. Yeah, so it is, it's far more complex. It's far, the incentives are really screwed up. Um, I mean, so if you want to go and understand the most dysfunctional thing in the world, go study healthcare in the United States, right? So it's like, okay, take on the biggest challenge. And then I look back at public education and I go, all right, there's hope for us, right? Um, so what they're doing in healthcare right now is very similar to what's happening in education. There is a very large initiative within Intermountain Healthcare that I'm studying that's called personalized primary care. And, and for a minute, think about why, why this is quite germane to education. What they're trying to do in the clinics is to have a much tighter doctor-patient relationship. So the corollary, um, student-teacher relationship. And they're trying to provide care in a personalized manner so that people don't accelerate acute conditions into chronic, that people who have chronic conditions start to get on top of them. One of the, there are a handful of very large drivers to cost in the United States in healthcare. Things like asthma, diabetes, heart, uh, coronary heart failure, uh, um, high blood pressure, uh, depression is actually one of the really big ones. And so what the personalized primary care is trying to do is look across the population of patients and say, okay, how do we individually meet their needs? How do we then provide the education? So this is a highly education-oriented program. How do we intervene? How do we use data? How do we follow up, right? So are all these things sounding familiar to public education? <laughs> How many have heard of response to intervention? So who wants to give me uh, a definition of response to intervention? Rick, do you want to take I'll do it if no one else will. I'll do my best. <clears throat> the idea is that um, you respond to the degree that the, the student needs to be assisted. Yeah. And so, um, Originally, you maybe don't need to do a whole lot, and then if you find someone, you, and the idea is to find them early before the situation becomes acute, yep. and start responding in degree before the situation becomes out of hand. Yes, and it's tiered, so 70% you know, um, might be in a, distant, a more traditional uh, set of interactions and structural interventions, and tier two, a little more rigorous, tier three. Well, personalized primary care is essentially a response to intervention model. They, they, they parallel almost exactly, right? Because you have a population of people, just like a school has a population. You have people within that population who have varying degrees of needs. And so the better you are at identifying those needs and then staying on top of those needs with data, how many are familiar with database decision making or data driven decision making in education, right? Anybody doing their research on data, data decision making here? Oh, okay. Um, but, but data is a big part of this. It's how do we then build the organizational structures and the organizational mechanisms to get either students, the multitude of students, to progress and grow and develop, or to get the multitude of the um, patient populations to grow and, and develop. Does that make sense? So they're virtually the same human activities. They both involve learning, they both involve growth, they both involve change, they both involve types of interventions, they both involve data, they both involve outcomes that you're concerned about, places you want them to go, those kinds of things. So the bulk of the time I want to spend today is discussing a set of concepts that are really, uh, this is, these are lessons I, genu I, I, I actually teach my kids these terms um, because I think they're so important. So, so 
when I got readmitted back into Cambridge, I took my 15-year-old. I had two more terms of residency. So my 15-year-old and I went over there a year ago, spring. And so she was with me, and she'd go to meetings and, and, and things. And, and we'd have these deep conversations about organizations and organizational economics and, and these kinds of things. And, and then last spring, I took my 13-year-old with me. And these, I really tried to embed, and I'm trying to embed these concepts in my kids. Because if you understand these, whatever research you do, whatever instruction you design, whatever educational organization you try to create will be better directed. And so there are five principles that I want to teach. Um, and, and so there are these principles right here. I don't know if you can see them very well. Can't see them at all. Um, there's got to be a way for me to just, if I'd have had five more minutes, I would have um, been able to uh, try the little uh, magnification slider there at the end. Okay, that's getting big. Um, I've got the word resources. <laughs> yeah, okay, so what, how do I, okay, I think I got this. Come on. There you go. Okay, we're getting closer, right? Is that getting a, li be yeah. a little clearer? Collapse the side. Okay. Basically, yeah, collapse the side. Uh, like yeah. side. where it no, no, says no, no, no. this, the slides shots of the slides, slides, outlines where your two little. I am go uh, up, up, go up, up here, up, down, down, over, down over. over to the right, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hot, cold, warm. Okay. Um, so we're looking under these this column right here. And, and so after two years of formally studying strategy and then founding learning.com and, and it turned out to, to be a, a reasonably successful endeavor, currently serving roughly four million students through state and district contracts. It dawned on me in 2005 what the whole point of life was and the human endeavor. Like, it was like, I, I just, I still remember sitting down with this mentor of mine, Lee Perry, who's over in the Marriott School, and we were at a macaroni grill, and they have, um, uh, you can color on your, right? And so I'm like spreading the, the, you know, everything around, and I said, Lee, Lee, I think really at the heart of what we're trying to do is create value for people in organizations, and that everything else is an appendage to that. That if we understand that creating value is the heart of what it is we're trying to do, with whatever endeavor it is that we're trying to do, then we can build the organizational governance, the capabilities, the resources, the instructional designs, the assessments around getting to that value. So that was in 2005, and, and I, I've just thought about it probably every day since then. I've written it, my dissertation uh, that I'm finishing up right now at Cambridge is around what are the drivers, what are the mechanisms that get you to value. But I want to spend the bulk of the time on talking about the nature of value. So if you'll look under organizational performance, I, I use that term because it's, it's it's a more technical term in terms of economics or management or, or those kinds of things, right? So it can be, you could call it performance, you could call it outcomes, you could call it results, you could call it desired um, cool things that happen. I don't know, I mean, the, the, it'd be some kind of direction that you're, you're walking your energies towards. And so in, in economic theory, how, how many of you, you and here are into things related to innovation. Well, that's a lot of, now raise those hands high again. I want to count that really quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Right, like more than half of this crew here 
has some thoughts about innovation. Now then, the, 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 the question is, how many of you in here know of Joseph Schumpeter who are interested in innovation? Everybody? Go uh, Google Schumpeter, S-C-H-U-M-E-T-E-R, I believe. Um, he is a very thoughtful economist. He's from Austria, but ended up in the States. And he talked about a term that's popular now called creative destruction. But that's not really at the heart of his message for me. I should, if I'd have known I was going to give this speech, I would have brought his book on the history of economic analysis that's literally as big as my hand is open. But he talks about three kinds of economic value. And these three kinds of economic value are, are really nice frameworks to think about value, to think about the outcomes that you're trying to get at with dissertations, with, with master's theses, with projects. The three primary forms of economic value are that can you ah, is this value and use so, so can you all see value and use there yes. mm -hmm. okay so what might in a clinical setting I've aligned value and use with effectiveness or quality <coughs> So, in a clinic, you're very much concerned about the health care outcomes of your patients, right? So, in a school setting, what is the value in use? What do we care about? What value in use do we hope that our students derive from this whole enterprise of a public or private or higher education, what is the value and use that we're interested in? I think that is a really interesting question. I think part of the reason why we struggle in education to uh, progress in our ways of looking at the system is because we can't agree on that exact question about what our value and use should be. Yeah. I read an interesting book in grad school where it said there's basically three main metaphors for the purpose of education. So if you ask three different people and say, What's the purpose of education? We'll get three different answers. And one was basically to be prepared for the workforce so you can make money. Yeah. The other one was to maximize human development so you can be happy. And that's kind of a liberal arts idea. You know, I'm yeah. going to go and I'm going to maximize my ability to be a full human being and be happy. And the third one was to promote uh, social um, equality kinds of things. That you can use education as a, as a, as a mediating way to equalize, you know, social inequality. Yeah. And there's those three different models, and you can ask three different people, and they'll each argue that their point of view is really what education is all about. And, yeah. and they're very separate, and it makes it hard to know what we are trying to achieve. That's it. Okay. So this, this is a, right, it provokes a very interesting set of discussions. But it frames it slightly differently if you're thinking about it in terms of value, right? Rather than just in terms of, quote, purpose. Oh, okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Because, look, we're, we spend a trillion dollars a year in education in the United States, right? So it's a very large economic institution. And some value should be derived from those efforts, right? So, if we're, so when you start to think, okay, in terms of value rather than purpose, it's slightly different because you're saying, well, if I'm not generating or in, or creating something here for the end user, then I'm not really sure if I'm doing my job, right? Andy had his hand up. I was just going to say that uh, <coughs> sometimes we look at it uh, uh, monotonically. We look at it as monolithically, as if there was a value. Yeah. And it was going to be one of those choices. But almost everything that we do is held in place by a whole variety of different values that it presents to us. Yeah. It's almost like a little energy low that we settle into. We do something, 
because it satisfies a group of needs for us, has a group of values, many values for us at once. So uh, it's, it's almost like it, I went to a leadership training once where they had a steel ring and a bunch of ropes leading away from it. Of course, they gave everybody a, a hand on a rope, and they were just supposed to use this steel ring now to pick up a ball and carry it so many feet and do something with it. But it had to be done by this group of people all together. It was very hard to do because so many different people were tugging so many different ways that they found it even hard to just pick up a simple ball and, and move it. But, but deciding what value we're getting from something, and it, it's a very dynamic thing, and, and many values at once determine what we choose. Yes. And so being cognizant of that, the, the value is something we hope to be generating or creating for the students, the you know, 55 million students in public education, should be something we're thoughtful about, right? In healthcare, it's about the quality of the, of the delivery of care and that those outcomes. That's kind of their, their simplified measure. Okay, then you end up in the second value, in value and exchange. Um, it's an efficiency cost thing in healthcare, but what might value and exchange be in public education? Yeah. So there's two. So there's two parts of the exchange equation, at least, right? There's the teacher, or there's the system, and then there's the the student and the parents, right? So once you start talking about exchange, you have to ask very hard questions about who has a stake in this endeavor. And the, and and so so instantly, an exchange question becomes a stakeholder question, and what is fair within that exchange? Minnesota is very supportive. Um, it's one of the better states in terms of just social support. For, um, but you think of all of the costs that went into his education and, and for what benefit? The cost benefit isn't necessarily, you know, that may be weighed against, I don't know, something like access, value, and distribution, or a value and use. If we do see something important about, Social equality or something, but that value um, butts up against sometimes some of our other values as well. Yes. So is that? So is it neutral? Is it, when we think about value, is it neutral? Is it is it a moral, <coughs> or is it in its essence ethically grounded? What do you, I mean? It, it's a. Yeah. So is there inherent, when you start talking about value and exchange, are there inherent conflicts that, that, that can emerge? Right? So if, if you're an administrator of a, of a district or a school, to be mindful of these kinds of values, right? Like value and use. I want kids learning, growing, developing, graduating, being creative, being prepared for life. Um, I want my teachers as reasonably compensated as I can, right? Um, but, but then there's going to be all kinds of constituencies pulling and, and stretching that boundary in value and exchange. Janelle, am I right on the... I got yeah. it right, yeah. Good job, thank you. Um, the way that educational leadership, as far as I understand it right now, is it's moving more towards that and towards like programs that are training their students um, to develop the skills to be able to make those kinds of exchanges um, for the most benefit <coughs> for themselves and, and to develop the skills they need to, to to be able to deal with those different values. And, and it's different stakeholders. Stakeholders, yeah. yeah. I spent, oh go ahead. When I sit on two levels because if you, it, it, I mean values by their very nature are, are bound with more 
moral and good bad implications. But if you make it neutral, then it's more widely available for exchange for a lot of different uh, value systems. And yeah, and stakeholders, right? And stakeholders. So, so it's interesting to, I mean, I, when you think of it economically and you think of trying to make it, you use the word value, but I almost think of it as value neutral so that lots of different, it can be employed for lots of different values. Yeah. Well, it's a very interesting notion, right? Because you, you have at one level, it's ethically grounded. At another level, you have value systems, right? And Utah is not the most diverse place on the planet, but, <laughs> but it's reasonably diverse, right? So you're, you're going to have different ethnicities, you're going to have different religions, you're going to have, I mean, if you're, if you're in Salt Lake, I've spent the last decade plus in, in urban school systems. And so I'm just acutely aware of the, of the diversity and the issues when you're talking about diverse populations. Right, so, so that's a really interesting point you bring up, right? So whose values, what, what, what does that mean, whose exchange, right? But these are interesting tensions that we have to be mindful of. And when we're researching, when we set up our dependent variables, our dependent measures, it'd be, it's just really helpful to kind of go through that kind of a value analysis and say, what, what am I looking at here? What am I trying to get at? Is this a value and use outcome? Is this a value and exchange outcome? Right? Uh, value and distribution. So this is, this is where all the hubbub uh, about the Affordable Care Act comes from, right? It's an access issue. It's a really interesting question because Who should get access to something, right? So it's a very interesting question, and I, I don't. So that is, and I don't want to debate this point, right? So it's just that that we swim in at value and distribution um, environments. How about education? How many of you have heard of drop down, you know, drop down, drag out fights around access issues? and distribution issues. I mean, this is a very common thing, right? It's, it's very interesting. I, I, have one son, I have a son who's still dyslexic and he's an, on an IEP. So what does that mean for him? He's in second grade. How do we think about that? How do we think about access to people who can actually help him? Are, are some places better at that kind of access than others? Are some better at access while at the same time doing it efficiently and effectively, right? So if you can get all three kind of swimming in harmony, value and use, value and exchange, value and distribution, then you have a healthy system. It's very hard to get there. And that's what I try to, I'm trying to model what are some of those key factors to get all three of those things playing as uh, happily and healthily as they can. But access distribution is a big issue in education, right? How many of you have public age school children, K through 12? Raise your hands. How many of you are mindful about where you live based on the nature of the school that your children will attend? <clears throat> right? We all have it. We're all, all thinking about this way. So every actor in the public education institution is thinking about access and where the best place that they can afford is for the best possible education. Virtually every person is thinking that way. It's a really interesting thing to think about when we're thinking about public education. Andy? And it's interesting to see how differently uh, people define that. For instance, uh, I live up Peak High School. Okay. If you have a youngster who is an athlete or <laughs> certain kinds of performing areas, uh, people are dying to get to that high school. Yeah. Unless you're a band. Unless you're a band. <laughs> you're a band. <laughs> you're a band. Where do you go? If you're in band, where do you go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, right? See, we're all doing this, right? We're all actors in this system making decisions about access. And if you want to excel in some of the other areas, you go to uh, Tim Q. If you want to play on BYU's football team, I think, isn't Tim Few the place? Provo. Pro oh, Provo. Tim, Tim View and Provo, okay. Yeah, um, my daughter is in uh, competitive drill. Oh, nice. Um, that is a different category of human behavior than I'd ever noticed. Like, like I, I wasn't prepared for it. And we moved, when we moved to Utah, so she'd done it. She had, was on the drill team in Oregon. And, you know, it was, it was a, you know, it was, there was energy behind it. But when you come here, it's, it's literally a religion. And, and, and there are schools, like Bountiful High School, they're the top dog in this food chain, right? They go to New York this summer, and they hire a, a New York-based choreographer. And they, so imagine flying, you know, 25 girls to New York, getting choreographed by a New York choreographer, and they did their entire dance on stilts. Even their, even their roles and everything, right? Like, all the other girls are just shell-shocked. They don't even know what to think, right? So we're, we're talking some really intense access and, and, and these kinds of things, right? It's, a really, it's just really interesting to kind of think about these three types of value. There's two other types of value that I don't spend too much time thinking about in terms of what I'm trying to do for students or patients. But they're kind of the elephants in the room. And if you're not aware of these elephants in the room, you end up getting burned. Um, so, so there's value in environmental fit. What this really implies is that as an organization, I have grown, adapted, evolved, co-evolved that I can still be in a position to gather external resources to continue on. Does that make sense? So even a school like BYU has to be thinking about this, right? Because if BYU's fit gets fundamentally off from its sponsoring institution, what happens to its environmental fit? Restructure. It does, right? It just is, and, and so, so each inst each organization, each school, has to be thinking about: Am I? How is my environmental fit? Can I can I continue to get resources next year, ten years from now, to do the endeavor of meeting the three things that I care about: helping students learn, helping them learn from a good teacher. In a, in, a, in a way that we can afford, and that the more kids that can learn from a good, effective teacher, the better, right? So we care about that. But if a system is, or a school or a district, is out of sync with its environment and no longer fits, then all of a sudden resources get consumed and pushed somewhere else. And so, so one has to be mindful of this. I'll give you an example. I helped turn around an elementary school in Cortez, uh, and Alicia Cortez Elementary School in Chino, California. Title I, test scores had dropped. They were on program improvement, you know, really nervous. So I, I met with the principal and I said, hey, I'll, I want to spend four months down here. I'm going to want to film this and see if we can get just this massive pop in student test scores so that you can, you know, not be in and risk for resources and that kind of thing. And, and by the grace of the heavens above, it, we got them there. So they ended up over the magic number that was utterly unexpected. And so they were able to su sustain more of their resources, get recognized as a Title I, as one of the top performing Title I schools, so more resources came, right? So there was this environmental fit thing going on. Now here is, so these are the two elephants in the room in any human endeavor, right? Environmental fit, people are thinking about this. BYU, when they did their uh, 
can't hire anybody, hiring freeze, uh -huh. was an environmental fit issue at some degree, right? It's like we need to be able to adapt for long enough so that we can survive and, and be in a sound position going forward, right? So there, these kind of decisions happen. Uh, and then the, the other big elephant in the room is the value and financial maximization. Healthcare, this is the corrupter. And it's, it's, it, it is never the stated policy or position of any healthcare system. But in operations, it, get, it is 90% of the effort. So this is, this is like, this is the elephant in the room that literally, it's the dinosaur in the room, right? It literally takes up almost all of the oxygen is this value and financial maximization. And so though we say we want greater quality and care and we say we want greater access and we say we want to do it more efficiently, ultimately every single person in an administrative position is paid based on the revenue they generate. So we have these values, but if that's your focus, that's what happens. So you end up with these same kind of tensions in public education, right? So where does this gather an astounding level of velocity? And who are the proponents of this? Well, to an extent, doesn't financial maximization play a role in how different disciplines are compensated for professors? Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, in a higher ed, it's a discipline battle. I can tell you who makes the most money on the campus. It's finance professors. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And way more than accounting. No, actually, accounting professors usually make more money than finance. Accounting do? Yeah, I, they've got an accounting, big accounting huh. PhD program in Georgia, and the accounting folks thought it was really funny that they made a lot more than the finance folks. But well, they, and they, there's they, two business schools I'm affiliated with that isn't the case. That wasn't the case. Yeah, see, it's a public institution, so you can look that up, and I did, and they made a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, so there's, there, there, that plays out across institutions of higher ed. But where else? I mean, where Actually, else? Uh, we have an alternative view over here. That's the football coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there you go. And I suspect. It? Yeah. Is because it? They bring in the revenue. Yeah. 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 They bring so, in yeah. alumni donations. And here's it's interesting. So is, is Bronco Mendenhall the highest compensated employee of BYU? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> but who would? If you had a penny to bet, who would bet Bronco Mendenhall is the highest paid person in view? Yeah, right. Um, so um, somebody had a hand. Yeah, I was going to say, this really is the big uh, thing that drives education, unfortunately. A lot of the state schools, I don't know how many of the students know this, but um, the state schools traditionally have been funded by the state. Yeah. And so they had, their purpose was to improve student learning and do all this kind of stuff, because that, that was the state's goal. But now it's more like like state schools like the University of Georgia and stuff like that, they're now about maybe five or ten percent funded by the state yep. and almost ninety percent funded by grants. Yep. And so you're seeing a shift in that the state can't fund the universities anymore, so grants have to, and if grants have to, then whatever you're doing on campus is basically whatever the grants want you to do. Yeah. And, and so grants are driving education. And what are they though their revenue? That's all it is. It's all about finding revenue. And so a lot of times you'll scratch your head and go, why are universities doing this? And it's pretty much just because they're trying to find revenue. <coughs> it's so it's, it's just important when, when you're thinking about your research, I think, I hope, I hope I've done this in a convincing manner, that you, you at least run through these five types of value because it, it helps you kind of see what are the conflicts or what is it I'm really trying to do? Is this, am I really trying to expand access? Am I really trying to increase value and use? Like David Wiley's doing this project with free or open source textbooks, right? So this is a, this is a case book um, example, a textbook example of, of three of these principles, right? Value and use. So we're testing if, there are, if a high school student's using open source, is the learning comparable to the $100 Pearson textbook? So that's a value in use, right? Value in exchange, six bucks, a hundred bucks. So we have an exchange efficiency issue going on. And access, if we can do it for six bucks a year or, or less, 
than the 100 bucks, do we have a different, does that change the access equation? Right, it does. So you, you have all these things swimming, and then, then what happens then is you end up having stakeholders in this span who are threatened by that, who will hire lobbyists, who will build in legislative uh, pressures so that you have to have textbooks this way, you can't print them, right? right? So what happens is you end up having these very big policy debates over something as innocuous at one level as open source textbooks. But I can tell you for sure, with absolute certainty, that in virtually every state in the union, there are lobbyists trying to kill open source textbooks. And there, I suspect there are, I bet you there's, I suspect, I suspect there's at least 10 million a year on the low side of lobbying dollars trying to kill open source textbooks. I suspect it's closer to 50, but, but I think it's at least 10. So, so, whatever you, so what I'm trying to do is say that whatever your endeavor as an instructional designer, as an instructional psychologist, that you're swimming in a, a sea of value choices. And the understanding the tensions between them, understanding what it is you're really trying to get at, when you're thinking about your dependent measures, it's just interesting to just kind of run it through these you know, five economic value ideas. I'm finding it really helpful from my research with Intermountain Healthcare. I'm doing it, uh, launching a very big project on high school graduation and trying to get at what are the governance and capabilities and mechanisms that explain differences in high schools around the, the state and the country. But it's, if you don't have the value, the, the outcome, the clear and its tensions, then you'll end up finding very different drivers to whatever it is you're trying to do, right? So this sets up what your independent variables are in a lot of ways because it, it'll, it makes you think through, okay, where am I trying to get? Okay, then what is it that's, what, what interventions, what instruction, what things are, are there for enabling or, or helping me get there? Does that, does that seem reasonable, a reasonable argument? And so, you know, so I'm, I'm playing with this, with um, taking this uh, model basically in uh, education. I'm not going to go through this, but this is basically doing the same, I've d taken the same model and done this for um, RTI or tiered systems of support. And I've gone through and, and, and looked at what I think the values are. And, and I, I have things like personalized growth, graduation rates, to total student load, these kinds of things. And then I have what um, I know from theory and from research are some of the mechanisms that lead to that. And, they, and they're, they bundle under governance and capabilities and resources. And, and instruction is both a resource and it's also effective instruction it has to have people capable of using it, right? So it's a resource and a capability. Does that make sense? And any assessment that is used anywhere is a governance mechanism. Because it's all about how do we measure, monitor, and, and, and these kinds of things. And I'm not going to get into the kind of why these mechanisms and what sets them up in terms of governance, but there's a causal model that kind of pushes you there. So that's how I've kind of come to orchestrate, understand education. And it doesn't answer all questions, and it is, it is economic at one level. But at another level, it's really about people, right? And value is about people, and people gain, getting something, them, them growing, them developing, them learning, them becoming. That's it, right? As, when I teach a class, I feel this profound ethical responsibility that if my students don't derive some value and use out of that class, I feel, I, I mean, I would just feel, um, 
really badly. Like, it's the kind of thing that I would, I would go to my bishop about. Like, I mean, I'd be so <laughs> concerned about it, right? I just think we, we have these obligations as teachers and educators. And if you're designing something for somebody in some educational setting, well, I sure hope that there's value in that, right, for the user. That they grow, that they learn, that they develop, that they become, that they are more than they were when they showed up at your module or your, or your endeavor or your class or your whatever you do, whatever you create. You know, it's about people growing. It's about people experiencing it. It's about people coming together as a community. It's about people um, discovering that they are capable learners. I think that for me, one of the old, one, the one of the things that I did when I tried to, when I was helping this school turn around is I knew that I had to shift, help the student bodies shift in their identity to see themselves as capable learners. And so I took and I worked with the the, the hundred most at risk kids, and spent we just, just we just spent amazing amounts of time and the teachers did and we really helped them shift in their identity to see themselves as capable learners. It was just a really amazing thing to watch. But we as designers, instructors, as leaders have at stake the identities of the people that we are in some way serving, right? And so I, I just hope we're mindful of that. Mindful of it from, a, from different perspectives and that we may get better at it, that we may improve in that endeavor is my talk. And I ended on time. <laughs> <laughs> there you right. go. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you.